This is the second recorded lesson for the Animalia Unit for students in Mrs. Stout's biology classes at Limestone Community High School. In this lecture, we will start talking about the phyla within Kingdom Animalia and start looking at some of the differentiation of these different groups. The first animal phyla we're going to talk about is Phylum porifera, and this does include all of your sponges. Now, the sponges are kind of a weird group because in their adult stage, they are sessile, and sessile means non-moving, fixed in one spot. But in their larval sp stage, they do satisfy that rule of being an animal and that they do swim around. They are free swimming. At one time, um, they were classified as plants because in the stage that they're most visible, they don't move around and they, they do kind of look like plants. In fact, many sponges have a symbiotic relationship with algae and um, so they will have like a photosynthesis going on, but the sponge itself doesn't do photosynthesis. In fact, its feeding method is filter feeding. So it sucks in a whole bunch of water and it has these little coanocysts and coanocytes that filter out the little pieces of food and eat them. Um, in fact, a sponge will suck in over a ton of water to get an ounce of food within, you know, every hour. So there are no tissues, no organs, no organ systems. They do have asymmetry, and they are kind of a, an aggregate of single cells working as one big organism. Sponges can reproduce, reproduce both sexually and asexually, and so they are hermaphroditic. You have one sponge produces both eggs and sperm, and it's just kind of released out into the water, and the eggs and the sperm fuse together to form that free-swimming zygote, um, the larva that then attaches to a surface, and that's when its adult stage is sessile, and it's, it doesn't move anymore. So as I said, they do produce free-swimming larvae, so that's what satisfies that animal rule of being moving, moving that attach to surfaces, um, sponges, who cares about them? Well, obviously they're used for cleaning and bathing, and they also can give off some chemicals. They've been used in human superglue. So if you've ever had an injury where they just glued it shut instead of using staples or stitches, um, this actually came from sponges. And in fact, when I was in college, I did a really cool experiment where we took a red sea sponge and we, it was alive, and we basically put it like in a blender and blended it all up. And then we observed it over several period, um, several days, several weeks, and it re-aggregates back into the fully functional sponge. No other living thing can do that. Like if I put you in a blender and blended you up, A, I'd go to prison if I got caught, but B, you would not get put back together. And because of this ability to regenerate and re-put back together, scientists um, studied sponges and um, then developed that super glue that is used. It is a lot better at healing. Um, the wounds heal faster because you're not introducing another wound. If you think about it, when someone gets staples or stitches, you're actually puncturing the person again. So you're introducing another wound to fix the wound, whereas the super glue doesn't, doesn't do that. Our next group are the cnidarians, phylum cnidaria. This includes your corals, your jellyfishes, your sea anemones. So these are going to be your stinging organisms. They are all marine, and marine means saltwater, so they're not a freshwater organism. These do have radial symmetry, which means they can be cut in half along many planes and still have right and left sides. Um, so we can usually think of these as circular um, and I mentioned that in the first lecture about how you can cut it in half and have equal right and left sides. They have one body opening, so they have a two-directional digestive system. Food goes in one opening, gets processed, waste comes out that same opening. They do have the two cell layers, so they do have the endoderm and the ectoderm. They do not have the mesodermal layer. They have a very simple nervous system, which is usually just a reflex arc, which is just stimulus response, stimulus response. Not really a whole lot of forethought, forethought, not a true central nervous system with the brain and peripheral nerves. Um, there are two body forms. So you have the polyp, and um, the polyp is what you can see when you think of like a coral. And in fact, on your note packet on the left-hand side, 
that is going to be the polyp shape. It is that circular body. It's tube shaped and it has the, the tentacles coming out. And then you have the medusa stage and that's the one that's over on the right. When we think of a jellyfish, the medusa stage is the one that we're most familiar with. However, all cnidarians have both a polyp and a medusa stage. When jellyfish, um, the medusa stage is the adult stage and it releases sperm and egg which fuse together into the larva and the larva attaches to a hard surface um, and then it develops into that polyp stage and then the polyps as they develop the little medusa stages come off of there and so that's the body that's the life cycle their feeding adaptations are not going to be our favorite and that's going to be those nematocysts those are those stinging cells so if you touch the jellyfish it's not that they hate you and they want to sting you it's just an automatic part of that reflex arc um, and in fact it's the oils from your skin that cause the outside of those cells to recess back and there's a barb that shoots out from them. So those stinging cells are called nematocysts. Um, with regards to reproduction, as I mentioned, they reproduce sexually during the medusa stage. That's where they release the sperm and egg, which fuse together, and then that larva attaches to a surface. And then during the polyp stage, um, you have the medusas bud off from it. So it, it's kind of, it's pretty cyclical. They are very important of the marine ecosystem, important part of the marine ecosystem. Um, they are predators. Many people can get stung. Some can kill. For example, the Australian box jelly. Um, it's from genus Irukandji. It is no bigger than your thumb. And it releases such a, a powerful toxin that it can kill an adult. Coral reefs are a important ecologically because they not only serve as a food source for other animals and as a shelter for other animals, but they can also help protect the land masses. Our next phylum is fly <laughs> the flat room group phylum platyhelminthes. And when I was first learning this, um, the way that I really helped remember the flatworms was the platyhelminthes as I, I put them together, plat, flat, plat, flat. So these are acelomates. They do not have a true body cavity. I don't know what that is. All right. So these are parasitic. Um, it does include tapeworms, which sheep, humans, um, I think pigs and cattle can get them too, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, also the lab animal planaria, which is really cool. There's actually an example of that in your notes on the right-hand side. And when you go to college, you might get the opportunity to work with planaria. Um, we don't really do a whole lot with live animals here, but I'll talk about those in just a bit. Um, they do possess a very primitive brain. And when I say primitive brain, I mean there's really only four functions that that brain takes care of. Mad, glad, eat, and then got to poop. Um, there's really not a whole lot of forethought to the primitive brain either, but it is a little bit more advanced than that simple reflex arc that the Cnidarians had. They can reproduce sexually, so again, they are going to be hermaphrodites. They produce both viable sperm and eggs, and only a true scientific, biologically speaking, hermaphrodite produces sperm and eggs. No humans produce both a sperm and an egg, so there's not a true human hermaphrodite. They can also reproduce asexually through fission and regeneration. Um, so in college, what we got to do is, if you look at the image that's in your note packet, we took a razor blade and we actually cut the um, planaria right along the middle anterior portion. So like basically right along its head and nose. And it regenerates and looks like it actually has two heads. So pretty cool. A lot to learn from that and the ability of these simple organisms to heal and um, grow new parts. So parasites, what are some adaptations? So these get food from inside the body of the host. So that is their symbiotic relationship as they are parasitic. And their mouth parts have hooks on them to help them hold on because they do um, hook on to the intestinal system. Now your intestines are really strong and they have a continuous wave-like contraction called peristaltic contractions. It's not very beneficial to these organisms if they go along with the wave and get pooped out of your body. So it's better if they can latch those mouth parts into your intestines. 
Um, they don't have a whole lot of nervous and muscular tissue. It, the majority is just reproductive tissues. For example, the tapeworm um, can grow up to 10 meters, so 30 feet. Your intestines have all kinds of room for tapeworms. And the majority of the body section of the tapeworm is just called proglottids. And those proglottids contain eggs, tapeworm eggs. So they can break off and make new baby tapeworms within the bodies. Our last group that we're going to talk about today is phylum nematoda. These are your roundworms. <coughs> Excuse me. These um, are adapted to live in all kinds of different environments, in soil and animals, in freshwater and salt waters. Um, they can live independently. They can also be parasitic. They do have a pseudocelome, so a false body cavity, tube-like digestive system, so they are pretty fancy in that they do have two body openings, both a mouth and an anus, so that's one-way digestive tract. Um, remember, if you have the one-way digestive tract in one opening out the other, then that's a lot better because um, the organism can be digesting different meals all at the same time within the body. They don't have to wait for one meal to get fully processed and come out before the next meal can go in. Some roundworms, some nematodes do have sense organs. Um, it's more so of an eye spot than a true multicellular, highly functioning eye like we have. And eye spots can usually detect um, like light and dark or sometimes even some infrared images, but not really a whole lot of depth like ours would do or color. There is an economic importance. They are common human and animal parasites. For example, if you have dogs and cats, it's important that you protect them against heartworm. Heartworm is spread by um, mosquito bites to our domesticated animals, and it literally is a worm that takes up residence in the heart of your pet, and it can kill them pretty, pretty quick. It's pretty sad. Pinworms are not really uncommon. They're more common in um, children, and they just come, it's a fecal oral contaminant, so fecal, feces, poop, oral, mouth, and that's their cycle, and that's why it's incredibly important that you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, um, because these pinworms finish their life cycle as they go through your digestive system, and when little kids have pinworms, um, you can actually see these little bitty worms, they look like a little pinprick, really tiny like super small grains of rice squirming around in their poop. Um, and that's the fun of the nematodes. We will get started with the mollusks on our next unit, or next recording.